So this will be the sixth online lecture for ECE 341. Last time we were talking about uh, the idea of conditional uh, probability density functions uh, taken from a pair of random variables x and y. Uh, we did not get a chance to do an example of that, so I'd like to begin today uh, by looking at an example of a conditional probability density function. If you recall from last time, we defined this idea of a conditional probability density function, little f sub x given y, uh, as an example here, um, and that would be as a function of x, right, given y. Uh, so this conditional probability density function is thought of as taking the joint probability density function, fxy, little xy, and we divide then by the marginal distribution, fy of y. And that's for the cases when fy of y is greater than zero. So this looks very similar to what we had for a conditional distribution with the probability mass function. It's just we're swapping out the probability masses with probability densities. So let's do a very uh, quick example of this as well. So as an example on this, let's go ahead and take a look at a pair of random variables. So we're going to go ahead and have a pair of random variables. These are continuous random variables, x and y, such that um, they're described in the following way. They have a joint distribution, fxy, of little xy, is being equal to, in this particular case, um, a constant. Let's let it be a constant, k, right? As long as x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to some r squared, and then we will let it be 0 otherwise something along those lines. If I take a look at this as a distribution, we might do just a little bit of sketching on this. I could go ahead and look in the xy plane, right? So I'm going to go ahead and draw in here. I'll let x be on the horizontal and y be on the vertical. Um, x squared plus y squared less than or equal to r squared describes a circle centered at the origin with radius r. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that in there. I'm going to go ahead and draw that circle. Since it's less than or equal to, we include the circle boundary. Um, go ahead and, and sketch this in uh, just to give us an idea of that. So we have some portion of, of the plane, the xy plane, for which we can have probability density. And it's described by this circle of radius r. So we know in here that if I had went out here and drew the radius of this guy, it'd be a radius r. And over that, um, it is a constant. So we know in that region there, that green region, fxy, little x comma y, is equal to a constant. Well, what's the area of a circle? The area, right, the area, the area of a circle is just pi r squared, right? And so if I want to make it so that this probability density function has a unit double integral, right? We have to double integrate two variables, so we'll double integrate fxy. Um, it's a constant over that circle, um, so we would just get the area of the circle weighted by a constant k. We need that to be equal to 1. So if I do a double integral of fxy, little xy here, right? We know that that's going to be a double integral over that circle, right? Just because that's the region of support for fxy. And it is a constant, right? And then we could do dx, dy, however you wanted to do that. That's going to be the area of the circle, right? Area of the circle scaled by k. And we know that that has to be equal to 1. Therefore, we can solve for that k that we need as being 1 over the area, right? 1 over the area. And we already knew the area was pi r squared, so we're going to get a 1 over pi r squared. So when I take a look at my joint distribution fxy of little xy, right, that is going to be 1 over pi r squared and 0. Um, it's 1 over pi r squared for when x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to r squared and 0 otherwise. So I've made this just a little bit crowded. Let's get that guy um, moved over just a little bit, kind of clean it up a little bit um, just to keep it so that we can... Uh, have an idea of what we've got. So that's just the joint distribution. Haven't really done anything yet um, with a conditional. So um, what would we like to do? Let's go ahead and use this joint distribution and let's find, in this particular case, let's go ahead and find the 
probability density function of y conditioned on the random variable x, a little y given x. I'd like to find that conditional distribution. In order to do that, what do we know it has to be equal to? It's equal to the joint distribution divided by the marginal distribution f of x. So I'm going to need to get the marginal distribution in order to compute out or figure out this conditional distribution. So I need, right, I need fx of x to find, at least in this particular case, this f y given x of little y given x. So I need to find this um, marginal distribution. This is something that we've looked at before. Um, if I take a look again at what I have, right, I have this, I have this region of support that's a circle radius r. I have an x variable on the horizontal, y variable on the vertical, and I want to find fx of x. What does that mean? I need to get rid of everything to do with y. So all of this y content, we're going to integrate it out. We're going to collapse everything down onto that horizontal axis. So what does that tell us? That tells us fx of x, right, is going to be an integral. It's going to be an integral of the joint distribution fxy of xy, right? And we're going to integrate everything out um, with respect to y over uh, the region of support on this guy. So how do I end up doing that in this particular case? Not too hard. If I look at that equation of that circle, right, I know that the circle is defined as an x squared plus y squared equaling r squared. That's the outer boundary of that. And if I solve that for y, I get y equals plus or minus the square root of an r squared minus x squared. So if I looked at some particular value of x and I wanted to get rid of the y, right? Um, I'm going to do this in, in red. So some particular value of x. I'm going to be integrating out the dependence on y, right? I'm going to go from the lower part of the circle to the upper part of the circle as, as values of y. So y equaling minus the square root of r squared minus x squared all the way up to y equaling plus the square root of r squared minus x squared. So now we're getting somewhere. We have this integral then going from minus the square root of r squared minus x squared to plus the square root of r squared minus x squared. And what am I integrating? Well, it's a it's a uniform actually over that circle. It was one over pi r squared, and I'm gonna do a dy on that. So if I go ahead and carry this particular one out, right, I end up getting a one over pi r squared times y evaluated from minus root r squared minus x squared to plus root r squared minus x squared. Do that calculation. Um, we have the upper limit minus the lower limit, which is just a negative of the upper limit. So I'm going to get twice that, uh, twice that upper limit. So I'm going to get a 1 over pi r squared to root r squared minus x squared, something along those lines. And where is that valid for? If I look back at what I've got, x as a variable, right? only can take on values from minus r to plus r, right? So this, uh, this, this marginal that I just calculated out is going to be uh, something valid over the values of x that are part of its range space, right? So we know that that's for norm x, if you will, less than or equal to r. We're on that, on that portion of the circle um, where we've got probability density. We can clean this all up. So what do we get? We get fx of x, right, as being equal to, and we have in this particular case, a 2 root r squared minus x squared divided by pi r squared. And we could do this as minus r less than or equal to x less than or equal to r. Those are equivalent, right, equivalent expressions, zero otherwise. Something to notice here is that this expression here, right, that we get is, um, is um, pretty uh, directly and easily um, represented. Uh, it's a, it's a, going to depend on that, on that distance that we are x, right? 
And the closer we are to the edges of x, so as x itself gets near a value of r, for example, if I put that into this expression, I'd get r squared minus r squared. That would go down to 0. Very little likelihood. This was a problem we had looked at before. And that's not a surprise. If we look back at the original distribution, right, for collapsing everything down from y, as we get near these extreme values of x, right, there's not much to, to collapse down. If you have x near 0, that's where most of this stuff, it was all uniform before. So uniform collapsing down is going to give us something proportional to that distance. Um, that's going to be the largest amount. So small values of x in amplitude are the most likely in here. OK, well, we've got everything we need now to go ahead and carry out and do this, uh, um, this conditional distribution, fy of f y given x that we had talked about wanting. So we were looking for f y given x of little y given x. We know that that is f x y of x y divided by f x of x. And what is that particular guy equal to in this particular case? Well, um, there's the part where uh, we are in a range value that is possible for y and those parts that are not possible. When it's not possible, obviously, we're going to get the zero, so we'll worry about that um, a little later. What is this ratio fxy divided by fx? Well, we had fx defined there, and we knew what fy was, right? fy, or fxy, the joint distribution, was just 1 over pi r squared. We had seen uh, that particular guy as well. That was uh, this expression that we had as well. So I am going to get down here as an expression, right? I'm going to have 1 over pi r squared, right? divided by, and if I take the other one, it is a 2 root r squared minus x squared over pi r squared. Those pi r squareds cancel, so we don't have to worry too much about it. So this whole thing is going to be 1 over 2 root r squared minus x squared. Right? Reasonably, reasonably simple one. And for when is that true? Uh, what is the values of that being true? Well, let's go back up and take a look. Well, actually, we'll just draw it here again. Let's go back and look at our joint distribution, right? We have the xy plane. So here's some values of x. Here's some values of y. We know that it was re, uh, um, distributed uniformly on a circle of radius r. So we have something out here with radius r. And what are we doing? We're conditioning on x having some particular value. So let's do that. Here is x having some particular value, right? This shows me a line cap x equaling some value little x. And what is the range or region of support for y? Well, y, right, goes from that lower part of the circle to the upper part of the circle as I've drawn the two edges of that line. We'd already calculated out those points. We know that those um, pieces in there are things like uh, y being equal to the square root of r squared minus y squared on the top and minus root r squared minus, um, I guess that was x squared. I should have uh, got that right in there. Uh, we have x squared, r squared minus x squared um, is my two values of, of y. So we can put that in here and complete things out. I'm running just a little bit out of space, so I'm going to have to put this down just a little bit, right? I'm going to say that this is for norm y, right? Less than or equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared, something along those lines. All right, let me just clean this whole thing up. I'm not totally happy with how that looks. I have fy given x of y given x, right? Is then going to be equal to, in this case, and I'm going to have a 1 over 2 root r squared minus x squared. I'm going to complete that guy out. And that's for y in magnitude being less than or equal to root r squared minus x squared, and it's 0 otherwise. Um, got our got our final result in there. Something that uh, we might we might notice on this, even though it looks a little bit complicated, this is actually a very simple uh, looking distribution. If I take a look at um, this uh, conditional distribution of y, and we look at what the probability density is, right? The probability density is this one over two root r squared minus x squared. Seems like a reasonably complicated expression, but um, notice something on this particular one, right? Notice something on this particular one, that that expression there, right, is not a function of y. In other words, it's 
constant. It's constant with respect to y. What does that tell me? That tells me that this, um, this uh, conditional distribution, fy given x, is uniform. So we could, we could make that note over here, f, whoops, I'm going to do that just in my standard, in my standard stuff here. Let's go ahead and put it in black. fy given x is a uniform, is a uniform random variable, right? Just a uniform random variable. It's going to be uniform over that over that um, region of support for y, which has been conditioned on x. So it's going to go from minus root r squared minus x squared to plus root r squared minus x squared. Here's another way that we might visualize this as well. So um, let's think again about what conditioning does. And we'd, uh, we've made these sort of observations before. We started with a joint distribution. This joint distribution was something that was uniform over a circle of radius r. We had looked at that before. So y on the, on the vertical axis, x on the horizontal axis. We said that we were going to condition on some value of x. So I come in here and I find a particular value of x. I look at right the value of my random variable x taking on a particular value, um, little x. If we visualize the original joint distribution, uh, you could think of this as a circular table sitting on a, on a floor, right? That circular table um, lifts off of the floor and it's got a flat surface. That's reflective of this joint distribution being what? A uniform uh, distribution over the surface of that table, that circle. Um, when I do a conditional distribution, I cannot change the underlying distribution. We saw that for the univariate case. It's true also for this uh, uh, this conditioning in in cases that involve two random variables. My condition here is taking a look along a line on that table. I can't change the fact that the table is flat. You might consider this as like me sawing through that table and then looking at it in cross section. So I do my sawing here along this table, right? And then I turn it on end and I look at it um, from the edge. And what do I get? I get from the edge, right, that flat surface of the table. So that's that flat table surface, right, table surface. That's that flat table surface. I'm looking from the side now, right? I'm looking from the side where I'm looking as a function of y, and this is my fy given some x. And it's going from minus root r squared minus x squared to plus root r squared minus x squared. Those are the two limits on this guy. And it's got just a flat, a flat distribution. How tall is it? Just tall enough so that this is this thing integrates to one, but it's uniform over that. This idea of a conditional distribution cannot change the underlying um, shape uh, that was part of that joint distribution. And if it was like conditioning on a random variable taking a particular value, that's like slicing that distribution along a particular line. And so you can look at that joint distribution in cross section and, and it would give you an idea of what that conditional distribution looks like. Okay, so I think we've uh, uh, got our way through that example. Um, some other things that uh, we know on this is that things like that fy given x of y given x, right, is a valid, is a valid distribution, distribution, distribution. And it has all of its statistics and that sort of stuff as well. So we could talk about things like what is the expected value of y given x, right? That expected value of y given x would be an integral of y times the conditional now probability density function integrated with respect to y over its uh, range space. We could go through the math on that. We could also just go back up here and look at it. What is an expected value? It's that balance point of the distribution, right? Where would this guy be balanced? We already know where that is for a uniform. It's right in the middle. And because plus root square root of r squared minus x squared is the same distance as the left side minus square root of r squared minus x squared, we know that that balance point is zero. So in this particular case, you could do it by math or you could do it by visual inspection. Conditional distributions are, are distributions like any other. You can do all the kinds of calculations and, and investigations with them like you would with any um, probability um, model. Okay, let's look at a, a little side a side um, topic that has to do with expectation and um, particularly those uh, involving conditional expectations. So uh, let's do uh, very quickly this idea of consider. So let's consider the following. Con 
conditional expected values. So I'm going to take a look at expected value of x given y equals y. And I'm also going to look at expected value of x given y. And I want to think a little bit about um, the difference in these guys. This first one, right, is conditioned on y taking a particular value of the random variable y. Um, that particular value is little y. So this depends, right, this depends on y, right, taking a particular value, little y, right? What comes out of this very likely would be a function of little y. So you would expect in this case, we would, we would expect, <laughs> that's uh, um, a little weird here since we're talking expected values, but we'd expect the result, right? We'd expect the result to be some function of little y. But little y is a particular value, so you could think of that as fixed. This next one is actually just a little bit different, but it's importantly, it's different in an important way. So <coughs> let's take a look at, at what this expected value means. This is an expectation. This is a conditional expectation. This expectation is conditioned. This is conditioned on the random variable y, right? That's not a specific it's not a specific value. It's the random variable. So in one case, we are conditioning on the random variable taking on an observed value little y. In the other case, we are just conditioning on the random variable y itself, in which case the particular might um, come out at some other time. Okay, that cap y is still a is still a value or is still a, a a thing unrealized. So we're conditioning on the random variable y. And what we would expect then is we'd expect we'd expect the result. It would look just like the other one, except for it would be um, not a function of little y. We'd expect the result to be a function of the random variable y. And why is that important? Anything that's a function of a random variable is a derived random variable, and therefore, right, expected value of x given y is a random is a random variable it is a random variable the first one right this first case we looked at we conditioned on a particular value little y what comes out then is just going to be a number this second case, we're conditioning on a random variable itself, and as a result, we get a function of a random variable, and that expectation now is a random variable. So let's recap that. That expected right value of x given y is a function right of random variable y and is thus a random variable itself. And as a random variable itself, it has things like a probability mass function or a probability density function, depending on whether it was discrete or continuous. It has its own mean value, right? It has its own variance. It has all that kind of stuff that we would expect um, a random variable to have. So expected cap x given cap y conditioning on a random variable returns a random variable. Well, let's think about that then. What is the mean of this random variable expected x given y? What is that? Well, the mean is just the expected value of whatever the random variable is. And we said the random variable was this derived random variable expected x given y. So now we get kind of a, a little bit of an interesting notation, right? We have an expectation of an expectation. 
these E's mean something a little bit different for each context. Um, this E of an E, this kind of nested set of expectations, uh, this guy is something called an iterated. This is an iterated, an iterated expectation, okay? And while we know what E generally means, we do have to pay a little bit of attention to make sure um, that we carry it out uh, as an operation correctly. Let's look to begin with at this inside piece, right? This inside piece. Actually, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm just going to think of the inside E. So let's think of this inside E. Expectation means what? It could mean uh, a sum or an integral, right? And so we could be looking at a sum or an integral. Let's, for the time being, just think about discrete time random variables. So expectation involves a summation, right? We're going to be summing up probability mass values. This is an expected value of random variable x conditioned on y. The thing that we are taking an expectation of is an x. So we are going to be summing up on that x value, right? That inside expectation is going to be a sum over x because we're taking expected value of x. Given y, y's are going to come out of that. What comes out of this whole um, interior expectation is some function of y. The next one then is what? It's an expectation of some function of y, right? So that expectation is going to be a summation over those values y. We use e in both case, knowing which thing to be to be summing over. You have to uh, figure out based on the context um, of, of the e being used. So let's go ahead and work with this a little bit more. We have e of e, right, of x given the random variable y something like that. We know that um, this outside one is a sum, right, over y and element of its range space, y and element of sy, of whatever we were taking the expectation of, that was my e, right, of x, right, and then we have given y um, in, in this particular case, um, and we will have that times uh, the probability py of y. We know that we can take the expected value of a function of a random variable without knowing its distribution. We just put that function in and we weight it by the probability um, mass function, in this case, the py of y, um, something along those lines. And if you look in the book, they, they, since we're summing over all the values of y, we're going we're gonna to take all of those guys having each of those values of y as we sum through it, um, something along those lines. Okay, so we can keep building on this. If I leave that outside sum alone, that's a y, summing over y is an element of sy. And I, and I look at that, that e in the middle. What is that expectation of x given y? Well, that's a sum over x, an element of its range space, sx, right? And then we are taking an expected value of x, so we put in our little x on that. And then we weight it by, it's a conditional expectation, so we're going to have a p of x given y, right? Little x given y. So I'm going to put that in curly brackets, right? That thing in curly brackets is um, the same thing as, as this overall expectation. So let me underline, underline that. I'll do that in red. This, uh, this first expectation, right, um, on the inside is nothing more than this curly bracket piece. Those are the same pieces. I still need to have the outside here of my P, my P, Y, my P, Y of, of Y in there, something along those lines. Okay, so um, in this particular case, uh, I'm going to make sure that... Um, I can uh, carry out the set of operations. I've got a double nested sum. It's y over an element of sy, then a sum of x over an element of sx. I've got an x times the conditional probability mass function, px given y, and then we've got that outside py. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to interchange my order of summation. So I'm going to have my sum x an element of sx on the outside, and I'm going to bring the other sum on the inside. There's no problem in doing this. Um, when I do that, right, I'm going to have then my summation y, an element of sy, and we still have all that stuff that was inside there. There's this little x, there's this px given y of, of, little, of little x given y, right, something like that, x given y, and we have that py of y in there. 
Now the interior sums on y. So that means I can do what? I could take out anything that had nothing to do with um, y. Um, there's one term in here that has nothing to do with y, and that's that x. That can pass outside of that sum not being a function of the sum variable, right? And, and I'm left with um, something just a little bit uh, uh, simpler. I end up getting, in this particular case, a summation on x and element of sx. And I'm going to have my x there, and then I have a sum of y and element of sy, right? And then I've got my px given y of x given y times p y of y. But what is that product, right? That product there. If you go back to your definition of a conditional distribution, p x given y, that's equal to p x y over p y, right? That was our definition of conditional. Well, I could take that denominator term, right, and multiply both signs by that p y. And what I see is that PY times PX given Y is equal to just the joint distribution. So this whole thing here is the PXY. And I'm summing out Y on the joint distribution. When I sum out all of a variable of non-interest, in this case Y, on a joint distribution, I get the marginal distribution. So we've seen this sum before, right? This gives me the marginal, the marginal distribution um, px of x. And so what I get out of all of this is a summation x and element of sx of x times the marginal distribution px of x. Well, what is that equal to? That's uh, even simpler, right? That is just expected value of x. It's the mean of x. And here we get our, our final result of, of iterated expectations. This idea that the expected value, right, of the expected value of x given y, right, is just expected value of x. So we get a we get a kind of an interesting simplification going going to the right here. I would make the the comment that sometimes it's 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 somewhat dependent on distributions. Um, we have this left hand side, we have this right hand side. So I'm going to call this left hand side one, and I'm going to call this right hand side two. Um, sometimes, sometimes, right, one is easier to compute than two. Right? And sometimes two is easier than one. It just gives us another tool to deal with stuff. Okay, it depends a little bit on context. We can generalize this idea of iterated expectation to be um, iterated expectations of functions of a random variable. And so in general, um, in general, uh, we get something like the following. We get the expectation of the expectation of now not just x, but any function of x conditioned on that random variable y, right, is just going to be the expectation of g of x. I should make a comment in here. Um, we had done before, right, this idea that expectation of expectation of x given y is equal to the expectation of x. Um, we had we had done this for we had just derived that for discrete time RVs, right? Um, it's the same, and you can check out the book on this. They go through the proof. It's the same for continuous random variables, okay? You get exactly the same form. It's just the expectations are now involved integrals rather than summations. So this general expression I'm doing up here works equally well for continuous or discrete random variables. And if we just, again, make an emphasis of what these expectations are summing or integrating over, let's work on the left-hand side and the interior expectation. We are taking an expectation of something that is a function of x. So we need to, on that one, sum or integrate, right, with respect to x. Once we've done that, the y's still persist, the thing we are conditioning on, and we're going to be taking an expectation of some function of y. That's going to be a sum or an integral with respect to y, right? And then the right-hand side, we're just taking an expectation with respect to an x variable. That guy is a sum or an integral with respect to x. We use the same letter E in all cases. We need to, um, by context, get an understanding of what it is that we are summing or integrating with respect to. We've also seen cases where E sometimes mean a single sum, right? And other cases where they maybe mean a double sum. Uh, so we have those sorts of things as well. 
one more one more topic then before we uh, finish this lecture out. It's not a not a super long one. Um, we're going to talk about the idea of independent, independent random variables. We'd had some some starts of this before um, earlier in the semester. Here we would uh, just like to think of this idea of independent random variables in the context of pairs of random variables and knowing their joint distributions. So let's say this, that random variables x and y, right, are independent. They are called statistically independent. They are independent if the joint distribution PXY of XY equals the marginal distribution PX of X times the marginal distribution PY of Y. That is the case for discrete random variables, right? If it was a continuous random variable, it's exactly what you'd expect. It's the joint probability density function little f's of x, y of x, y is equal to a product of the marginal distributions, little f sub x of x times little f sub y of y. That's for continuous random variables, something along those lines. Okay, so independence says that I can get the joint distribution just by a product of the, of the marginals. And that sort of makes sense, right? Because if x doesn't really impact y in any particular way, um, right? Uh, we wouldn't expect there to be any kind of like cross-term um, dependencies involved in there. Independent random variables have some nice properties, um, and actually we could also see some other niceness on that. If we were going to maybe write that in just a little different way, remember remember where maybe this comes from. If I looked at something like, how about um, P of X given Y, this conditional distribution, what was that equal to? That was P X Y over, right? this idea of p, y. That was by definition. But if they're independent, what do we expect? Conditioning on y shouldn't make a bit of difference. We would expect this guy to just be p, x, that knowing y doesn't tell us anything about, about x. And so how do I get that on the right-hand side? The only way you could get p, x out of that thing on the right-hand side is if the joint distribution was p, x by p, y, such that when we divide by p, y, those p, y's cancel, right? So we know just from, from maybe this idea of a conditional distribution, why independence requires that the joint distribution be a product of the marginals. Um, that's the only way that we can get that conditional distribution, right? Not depending on the thing we're conditioning on, which is what we'd expect. Um, we'd expect for an independent random variable. Knowing the thing that we're conditioning on doesn't give us any information whatsoever. Independent, independent random variables, random variables have some extremely nice, so we'll just call them nice properties. Independence, it turns out, is really your friend. It generally makes things incredibly um, nicer and easier to work with. Um, independence is something that we, we absolutely love to see uh, when we're lucky enough to get it. So um, we've already seen this first one. We know that P of X given Y, right? Little X given Y is equal to just P X of X. We had done that derivation up on top. Uh, for continuous time, it's the same sort of an idea. F X given Y of little X given Y is just the marginal density function F X of X. Knowing the thing we condition on makes no difference, right? We could also do this with respect to y. Um, it's the same. It's the same result. We can get something like the following too: the expected value of g of x times h of y equals what? Here I'm doing an expectation of two random variables. If you think about what the e means there, right? This is going to be an expected value of something that's a function of both x and y. So that would be um, a double integral or sum, right? So we're going to have a sum pair or an integral pair, and we're going to be doing it x and y on there because I've got something that's a function of both x and y, right? Um, what do I get out on this? Well, if they're independent random variables, I can write this as an expected, um, let me make sure I get this right, an expected value of g of x times an expected value of h of y. 
Now in this, in this kind of factored form here, this first expectation is just a single integral or sum, and it's with respect to x, and the second one is a single integral or sum with respect to y. So instead of a double integral or a double sum nested one another, right, and trying to figure out how, how limits of integrations um, you know, uh, interact with one another, all that kind of stuff, we just get a product, a product of two single dimensional first first um, um, uh, first uh, uh, integrals or a single integral or a single summation in there it dramatically improves the simplicity of the calculation how would I get this well let's look on that left hand side I have a summation right that we know is going to be on our x or y I'm going to have a summation that's going to be on our y the thing that we are taking a, a expectation of so that's a g of x and I have an h of y h of that should have been a y in there you could do the same thing here for for continuous random variables i'm doing it for discrete at this point what does it get weighted by it gets weighted by the joint probability mass function pxy but i know that that's going to be a sum over x and a sum over y and we're going to have our g of x and we're going to have our h of y but in the case of independence pxy is just px and it's py I can rewrite this slightly differently, right? I can have this as a sum over x, and I can have a sum over y. The sum over y is going to be only involving things involving uh, that have a y in it. So we have our h of y and our p of y. Anything that did not depend on y could have been pulled outside of the sum. So going back to the original one there, there's this term gx, there's this px not being a function of the sum variable y, right? They can be pulled outside of that. And so I get on the outside here, right? I'm going to get a g of x times p of x if i work on this inside piece what is that inside piece that is just expected value of h y right and now that is not a function of the variable x and it can be pulled outside with re regard to this other x right and what we end up with here is going to be our expected value of h of y times, well, a sum over x of gx px, which is just expected value of g of x, and we're done, right, exactly as we'd expect. If I have, right, an expectation that involves um, x and y's that can be factored, right, that can be factored into something just as a function of x and just something that is a function of y, right, and I also have independence, then I get this beautiful result, right? That I can get that expectation is just a product of uh, lower dimension expectations, expected GX times expected HY. Easy to prove and definitely a time saver as we, as we go in there. What other kind of properties do we get in here? Well, our XY, right? The correlation between X and Y, which is equal to the expected XY. Well, that's factorable, right? And we know that that has to be expected X times expected y. It's a much simpler calculation now. It's just the mean x times the mean y. If those guys are zero mean, either one of them, then we know that the correlation is equal to zero. The covariance, right? The covariance that we get in there, if I look at the covariance between x and y, this is a mean adjusted second moment. Well, with that mean adjusting, it's going to make it for sure. Um, we're going to still get a product of expectations, but those expectations are both going to be zero. So I'm going to get uh, zero times zero. So the covariance, right, for independent random variables must be zero, which also tells us that the correlation coefficient for independent variables is equal to zero. If you have independent random variables, if you have independent random variables, it implies that the correlation coefficient is equal to zero. I would warn or just caution you that it does not go in the reverse direction, right? Um, maybe I could have done this more in this other way, that going in the reverse direction, that um, having a correlation equaling to zero does not lead to independence at Absolutely not for all cases. Um, but if we have independence, we certainly can save ourselves some work. We know that they will be correlation coefficient equal to zero. Um, a few others that we'll do just to, to finish this out here. The variance of x plus y, if you remember when we did variance of sums like this, we had a variance x term, we had a variance y term, and then we had that extra term that depended on the covariance, but we know covariance is zero for independent random variables. So a variance of a sum is just the sum of the variances when they are independent. 
Furthermore, we can get other stuff like, um, and this is not going to be a big surprise, expected value of x given y equaling some value, right? This conditional expectation just has to be expected x. Knowing y doesn't do anything for us, right? And that's true for all y, an element of all the values in its range space, and so forth, okay? So there's a lot of examples in there. I'm just going to say, check out all the examples. Check out the book examples, the book examples, examples. Um, they're good, right? They're good. They've got some nice examples of this. In the end, independence is really just a condition that makes things a lot easier. The joint distribution becomes a product of the marginals. There tends to not be all these cross um, terms. Conditioning uh, tends to become much simpler. You know, conditioning um, one variable on another when they're independent doesn't really provide any extra in, in, any in, any extra information in there. Um, a final reminder in here: uh, typically, uh, typically, right? If x and y are are independent right or independent we know that that range space sxy um, is rectangular okay that doesn't mean all rectangular range spaces uh, give us independence but if they are independent the range space is going to be rectangular because you cannot have any value of x or y changing uh, what happens with uh, the other variables so um, you have to get these regular boundaries um, on on the x y plane um, this really does uh, uh, lend to this uh, separability of the probability density or probability mass functions um, which we saw we got with independence as well so next time next time um, we're going to talk joint Gaussian, right? So if a pair of random variables x and y are both um, distributed as a normal or a Gaussian random variable, we'll deal with that next.